In a remarkable exercise spanning the past 15 years, the last survivors of the Great War were interviewed on film. These are unique stories of courage, sacrifice and tragedy told by the men who were there. Now, to commemorate the 90th anniversary of the armistice, these extraordinary interviews have been brought together for the first time. This six-part series begins in 1914 with the wave of fervent patriotism that accompanied the outbreak of war. It was a euphoria that would soon be shattered, lost in the shell-torn landscapes and water-filled trenches that spanned the Western Front. More than once you could hear the whiz of a shell going past. Chappie on my right, I was speaking to him about something, and then I turned to this fellow, I turned back again, he was missing. One of those shells, straight at him, he was missing. It made you never forget it, never, not even to this day. Just to think you, you shot a man, you know, for, and do nothing at you. That's how we were on, young and daft. Uh... These are the last voices of the Great War. I'm like this in the trench with a cigarette, my last cigarette in my fingers. And I was like that. Oh, I don't mind telling you. All feelings of humanity leaves you when, when you're fighting. You've got no feelings of humanity right then. Afterwards, yes, perhaps. Of the song would begin. From his vantage point on high ground, signaler Tom Dewing watched as the catastrophic events of the day began to unfold. I remember the mine going up. We had been told beforehand that it was going up, and there was a terrific explosion. The whole ground shook. And that came a few seconds after the, after the uh, explosion itself. Seconds after leaving the safety of these woods, Fred Francis was shot in the hip by machine gun fire as all around him his colleagues were being mown down. And I dropped on my face. I put my steel helmet on the back of my head and I could hear the shrapnel drop, dropping on my steel helmet. I just said to myself, this is the, this is the last of the lunch I ever tell you. There'll be no battalion left after this, and there wasn't, and never has been. Yeah, we know what it's like now. You know what it's like. You know what it's like to sleep. You know what it is like to eat. You know what it's like to go over the top. Well, yes, there's no doubt about it. You get hardened sometimes. And you wonder all the time when it's going to finish. When is it going to finish? And you're hoping you get a blighty one somewhere. It's not serious. Some men were so desperate to escape the action, they would do anything to get a blighty wound. An injury not bad enough to be life-threatening, but which would require treatment back home. The chap is sitting next to me, lying on his stomach. His legs up in the air, like that. He's lying down there. His legs up in the air. I said, keep your legs down. Why? I said, you'll get shot. He said, I want shot. I said, why? Absolutely. That was the finish until I, I got out of Carlisle. For many of the men who crossed the channel back to England, there followed a long and painful period of rehabilitation. Some would have to undergo further operations and learn how to use artificial limbs, while others suffered from dreadful mental illness. 
And all the while, the nurses who cared for them put on a brave face as they dressed gangrenous wounds, helped to sever limbs and cradled dying men in their arms. For them, the horrors of war were just beginning. During the Great War, perhaps the biggest threat facing men wounded at the front was the onset of gangrene. In the days before antibiotics, gangrene spread quickly, and without the swift amputation of the affected area, soldiers had little chance of recovery. Most feared was the condition known as gas gangrene, caused by bacteria which thrived in the muddy fields of France, often entering wounds on fragments of filthy uniforms pushed into the body by shrapnel. General nurse Nora Clay worked at a hospital in Leeds. They came in with terribly septic, deep, gangrenous wounds. And one of my vivid recollections when I was on the military ward was a man with a gaping wound about 14 inches long, right down to the bones of his lower leg, and I should think about two inches deep, and in the depth of that wound, there was patches of gangrene. And they found that by introducing maggots into the wound, the maggots ate the gangrene, 